Se un giorno vi capitasse di andare a Edimburgo potreste andare a fare una visita al Royal Museum. È qui infatti che si trovano i resti impagliati di Dolly, uno degli animali più famosi nella storia della, della scienza, la prima pecora, nonché il primo mammifero ad essere stato eh, clonato con successo da una cellula somatica, sebbene non il primo animale in assoluto ad essere stato clonato con successo. Era il 1996, eh, anche se poi gli scienziati annunciarono la sua nascita soltanto dopo qualche mese, nel febbraio del 97. La storia di Dolly, che è anche parte del titolo di questo incontro, ha avuto un'influenza molto importante nello studio della genetica e delle cellule staminali e ha aiutato lo sviluppo di metodi di editing genetico sempre più efficaci e precisi. Tecnologie e medici che possono avere anche un impatto importante nel settore zootecnico, ad esempio Pensiamo eh, magari aiutando il maiale a restare resistente, a rimanere resistente alla sindrome riproduttiva e respiratoria o alla peste suina africana, i polli immuni all'influenza all aviare, oppure migliorare i bovini per aumentare la produzione di latte nelle aree eh, tropicali. Ovviamente le implicazioni etiche e normative sono estremamente complesse e una delle grandi sfide che oggi la politica e la collettività devono affrontare è proprio quella di cercare un punto di incontro, un di equilibrio tra gli strumenti eh, che il progresso scientifico mette a disposizione, pensiamo ad esempio restando al campo dell'editing eh, genetico al fenomeno CRISPR, alle questioni, però queste, queste, il progresso scientifico deve armonizzarsi anche con le questioni economiche, sociali e ambientali legate alla produzione e al consumo di cibo e non dimentichiamo, come dicevamo prima, gli aspetti etici. Ecco, cercheremo di affrontare la questione focalizzandoci principalmente sulla parte scientifica e di ricerca e per farlo torniamo a Edimburgo per incontrare uno dei più autorevoli esperti nel campo eh, del miglioramento genetico delle specie zootecniche. Lui è Simon Lillico, è ricercatore del Roslin Institute dell'Università di Edimburgo. Hello Simon, welcome to the fourth edition of the Food Science Festival. Thank you for joining us and it's such a great pleasure to have you with us. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, thank you. So I would like to start from the first question. I was, uh, uh, in my introduction, I mentioned that development of biotechnology has triggered many ethical and social reaction from the public opinion, the media and the organization. Uh, but when we talk about genetic and biotechnology, we usually think about uh, agronomy and plant breeding. But uh, when we this topic deals with animals, the public dislike seems to increase. In other words, public support for transgenic and cloned animals is lower than that for transgenic plants. So let's try to take a step back and uh, what is the role of genetics in breeding and farmed animals? And it is a question related to contemporaneity and the advances in science of the last century, or it is a little bit more complex and articulated story. Okay. So, the first part of your question is relatively simple to address. Genetics is extremely important in modern animal agriculture. So, rather than taking a step back, let me take a huge leap back in time. It's thought that about 10,000 years ago, our Stone Age ancestors first domesticated the wolf. And it's likely that that initial selection will have been for animals that were less aggressive and more relaxed in the presence of humans. However, over thousands of years, we've selected our wolf stock for other traits, whether it be for dogs that are big enough to hunt wolves themselves or obedient enough to herd sheep without eating them. This selection for aspects of form and function is actually selection for the genes that underlie these biological traits. So on slide one, you'll see that what we've ended up with is a multitude of dog breeds that no longer look or behave much like a wolf and which are genetically distinct from their wolf ancestor. The same can be said for the prey species that we've domesticated as well. So if you have a look at slide two, you can see that there is huge diversity 
in our sheep breeds because we've selected these to survive and thrive in different conditions and to further selected for specific breeds or for specific functions such as growth rate or the type of wool that they produce. Again, each of these breeds is genetically distinct from each other. Or pigs. Ask any school child what colour a pig is and they'll tell you that it's pink. But if you have a look at slide three, you'll see that's because our farmyard pigs are based on these pinkish breeds that grow fast and produce lots of offspring each year, but they don't look much like the ancestral wild boar anymore. So you see the history of domestication has actually been a long history of selection for the genetics that underlie the biology that we humans want in our animals. Selective breeding, the act of choosing which animals we mate together is the very foundation of livestock agriculture. We want the animals that do the best in the environment we keep them. And that best can be measured in a variety of different ways. Do they grow faster? Do they produce more meat or milk or wool or eggs? Do they survive better when a disease passes through the herd or the flock? These are the animals that we look at and say, ah, I want more of that. And so we set out to breed these desirable few so that their genes are the ones that pass on to the next generation. In the last century, our understanding of what genetics actually is has seen tremendous advances and these have been applied directly to the selection of livestock. The outcome of this has been huge productivity gains as you can see in this example on slide number four. So this is dairy cattle over the last 25 years in the United Kingdom. And you can see that the size of the UK dairy herd has reduced significantly over that period of time. But the amount of milk produced by each animal during that same period has increased. So now we produce more milk with fewer animals. And this is the real power and importance of genetics in breeding. And you're right, there is a difference between how we look at crops and how we look at animals. And rightly so. Most people don't much care what crops think or feel because as far as we're aware, they don't do either. But in Europe, we do care deeply about the welfare of our animals. So yes, there's a difference in sentiment between making a change to a gene in corn as opposed to making a change to a gene in a pig. And I think that it's important as scientists that we engage with the public and describe to them what it is that we're trying to accomplish when we make these changes. There will always be people that find new technologies exciting and want to see them applied. But at the same time, there will be those that find new innovations such as cloning or transgenesis or genome editing somewhat sinister and threatening and feel that the deliberate modification of an animal's genes is in some way unnatural. Now, there's no right or wrong to these views themselves. And obviously, I have my own bias. What I would say again is that we have been applying artificial selection to the genes of animals for thousands of years and that these new technologies just expand on the options available to us. Thank you, Simon. And um, many scientists uh, state that fear of dystopian change should not blind us the potential the potential of gene editing. So actually, what are the main and most promising areas of research and agricultural application of genome editing in farmed animals? And what are the main obstacles from a scientific point of view? Okay. So first, I think I would like to define a few terms here so that we don't get confused. Cloning and transgenesis and genome editing are not all the same thing. Right. So if you look at slide five, I've put this as an example. So cloning is the act of taking a cell from an animal and using it to create another gen genetically identical animal. Right. And that's how Dolly the sheep was made. She was made by taking a mammary cell from one sheep and cloning it to make another sheep that was genetically ident identical to the sheep from which the mammary cell was taken. 
Transgenesis is different. Transgenesis is the act of taking a gene from one species and putting it into another species. And you can see that here in these pigs that have a transgene for a fluorescent protein that's been taken from a jellyfish and inserted into their genome. Finally, genome editing is the act of using a new set of molecular biology tools that allow us to make very precise changes to the genome. Just as an editor might edit a book, changing a letter or a word here or there in a very precise manner, genome editing is the act of editing the genome, making very precise changes one at a time at one or multiple positions in the genome to have the effect that we want. Now, these three techniques, cloning, transgenesis and genome editing, can be used separate from each other, but they can also be used in combination and that obviously can lead to some confusion. With respect to genome editing in agricultural livestock, there are active research projects around the world and I'm not aware of all of them, but these are all seeking to alter the genes responsible for traits that are of interest to farmers. If I may, I'll give you an example of one that I've been involved in, because obviously I know a lot more about that. So yes. slide six shows you an example of a pig disease called porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome, syndrome which is caused by the porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome virus. This is a disease of pigs. It causes late stage abortion in pregnant sows. It causes death of newborn piglets and it causes disease in older animals that prevents them from growing well. It is a global disease. So many, many areas of the world suffer from this. And while there are vaccines, there are also lots of different strains of the virus and the vaccines don't cross protect against different strains. It's worth pointing out that this porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome virus infection is also one of the biggest contributors to antimicrobial use in pig farming. It affects the lungs, the respiratory system, the immune system. So pigs quite often get secondary infections needing then need antimicrobial treatment. In the European alone, it's estimated that this disease costs about 1.5 billion euros in economic loss to farmers every year. And that's just in the EU. So in China, it's been an even bigger problem over the years. And actually before the outbreak of the African swine fever epidemic in China, PERS was the biggest disease of pigs in the world, the biggest impact on pork production. Now, as with all virus, the PERS virus needs to get into cells of pigs in order to copy itself. And to do this, it needs to bind to one part of one specific protein on the surface of the cell. Now, because we knew what this was, we were able to use genome editors to make a small change to the pig gene that encoded this protein, such that the virus was no longer able to bind to it. And what you can see here in slide number seven is four pigs that have been edited and four pigs that have not. And so looking at the pigs, you've got eight pigs standing in a row there. You can't tell the difference. They look the same, they behave the same until you introduce them to the virus. Then there is a very big difference. So the edited animals are completely resistant. If you look at that graph, you've got four lines along the bottom which are the resistant edited animals, and four lines that are going up in an almost exponential manner, which is showing the number of viral particles in the bloodstream of the animals that have been infected with the disease. So by changing the protein that the virus would normally bind to, we've managed to make pigs that are completely resistant to infection. Now, with respect to your other part of your question, obstacles, from a scientific point of view, the main obstacle is knowledge, right? And I think that's true in all areas of science. Specifically here, we need a very good understanding of the genes that are associated with the traits that we're interested in before we can make good decisions about which to change and how to change them. 
Science itself is an ongoing voyage of discovery and our understanding of these relationships is improving day by day and year by year. Okay, thank you. So science is constantly and slowly improving uh, itself, but uh, we have to deal with uh, uh, with laws. So when we talk about uh, European regulatory situation, uh, how Europe is responding to this scientific challenge, for example, compared to United States or Canada or China or Brazil or Argentina that are working hard in they are doing a lot of new things in uh, uh, from the, the the regulatory point of view in uh, genome editing. So, are there any good examples or priorities in your opinion that could also be useful for European scientific uh, research? Mm. Uh, that's a slightly difficult question. So, different global jurisdictions are considering genome editing in different ways, and I'm not an expert in these fledgling regulatory frameworks. I do know that some South American countries, for example, have said that if the editing event only involves removing bits of DNA, like we did for our pigs that I just described, then they do not intend to regulate it or that if the editing event replicates a gene variant that can be found in another breed of the same species, that would also be exempt from their regulation. And there is some logic to these decisions, but I think that actually if I was a regulator, I'd want to know on a case-by-case -case basis what it is you were changing, why you were changing it, what you were predicting the outcomes would be, and then showing that that's actually the case. That seems to me logical. For example, I personally know how to edit the genome of pretty much any livestock species in line with these regulations that have been produced in South American countries, and I could make animals that grow faster, right? I could do that. But there may be welfare implications associated with that, and these should be considered. And as such, I think changes, no matter what the change, should have a degree of regulation associated with it. The European Union has gone entirely the other way and said that any and all intentional modification of a livestock genome must be regulated following the guidelines that they already have in place for regulation of transgenic animals. And again, there is logic to this position. Unfortunately, I think that the this process in Europe for regulation of transgenic food animals is sufficiently difficult to follow that it effectively excludes them. I know individuals or companies are likely to commit the financial investment necessary to get such animal products to the market. And as such, I think the current framework in the EU means that in farming, we are likely to become less competitive on a global stage in the medium term. Okay, I understand that we in Italy, <laughs> we, we understand the situations a lot because uh, many years ago, uh, um, we had a very long and important tradition in genetic studies and research and uh, some laws that were uh, were written like 20 years ago i don't remember exactly the year but uh, uh, they put a very very big limits in uh, research in scientific research so it's very big issues um, I, I would like to ask you what, which and how many Animals have been cloned or genetically edited in the world. How are they monitored, and uh, what are their health and well-being condition? Because it's not. Oh, that is a that is a very very broad question. <laughs> <coughs> okay, that's broad and complicated, and I don't have a complete answer. Um, with respect to editing in a research environment, there are likely to be many many animals in labs around the world, um, and monitoring of these is going to be at both local and national levels, and it's gonna vary from country to country. So in the UK, so I can tell you about the UK because I have to 
conform okay. to the framework in the UK. So, if I want to create a new edited animal, I need to write an application to my university ethics board seeking permission. And in that application, I need to detail to them the species I want to work with, the editing event I want to create, why I want to create it, what possible welfare issues could arise and how I'll monitor for these, how many animals will be involved in the experiment, any intervention such as blood sampling or scanning that I intend to perform, how often I intend to perform them. So there is a huge list of things where I need to detail well in advance what it is I intend to do, what I think is going to happen when I do it, and how I'm going to look after the welfare of the animals. Now, if I get approval from the university, I then need to repeat the process and apply for permission to the government, detailing exactly the same issues. If I'm granted permission from the government, then all of the animals on the project are monitored throughout, both by a dedicated welfare officer and a university vet, and also by a government vet, and only the procedures that are pre-approved on the original application can be performed on the animals. So I can't say, oh, actually, I want to do something else. I would need to go back to the government and apply for permission to do something else. So we need to think very carefully about what it is that we want to do and how we're going to monitor that. I presume that similar regulations and restrictions are in effect throughout the European Union, but as I say, different countries will have their own rules and their own monitoring structures. Health and well-being will be dictated in part by the genetic changes that have been made and by the legal requirements for housing and monitoring, etc. With respect to edited animals, in agriculture, while there are some in the pipeline, as far as I'm aware, these are still largely research projects at the moment. So the pigs, for example, that I talked about earlier, are not available to the market yet. They've been taken up by a breeding company who in the US are conferring with the FDA to seek approval to get these to market, but that's not a done deal as yet as far as I'm aware. Um, and so because these are still research projects, there aren't large numbers of edited animals in the agricultural arena at the moment. And again, monitoring requirements for animals in agriculture, once they're approved, are likely to fall under normal monitoring of agricultural animals, I think. But again, this will be regulated at a national level. With respect to cloning, again, the rules vary around the world. So focusing specifically on agriculture for this question, I believe that cloned animals are effectively banned in Europe, not because of any food safety concerns, but rather because of issues associated with the welfare of the clones and of the surrogates that give birth to them. The US is different. So in the US, the FDA has concluded that because there are no food safety risks, products from clones or from their offspring don't require any specific labeling detailing their production. So while it's not legal to sell clones or their offspring for food in Europe, I, we can't produce them here ourselves for that purpose. It's likely, actually, that semen from bulls cloned in other parts of the world will have been imported into Europe. And as such, the offspring of clones are actually likely already part of our food supply. Now, this becomes a bigger issue when we consider genome editing, as each country sets its own rules on what is and isn't permissible and what does and doesn't require to be traced it's going to be really interesting to see how these systems are enforced with respect to trading partners going forwards. Thank you, Simon. I would like to ask you two more questions. Uh, one, uh, during, during this day of the Food Science, Food and Science Festival, we are talking a lot about climate change and uh, resources, uh, soil consumption, and so, so when uh, uh, how does the idea of, produce, of producing transgenic uh, and cloned animals reconcile with the fact that 
we have to eat less meat? Are there are any studies that go in that direction of producing, producing animals that have less impact? Oh, that's a good question again. Um, so yes, in the Western world, there is a modest drive for consumers to eat less meat, either for health or environmental or ethical reasons. What impact this will actually have on demand remains to be seen. And demand, of course, will be influenced by a growing population. At the same time, newly affluent populations around the world are seeking higher protein diets. And most of this is anticipated to come from animal products. My personal view is, as a, a scientist who works at this interface with um businesses and farmers, I think that we shouldn't be focusing on productivity as the primary objective of genome editing, but instead we should be focusing on positive welfare. Although, of course, there has to be a financial benefit to the businesses involved in the supply chain for these products to make it to market. So the PERS study with the pigs that I described earlier certainly fits this requirement. By making animals that are resistant to this disease, we have healthier animals, which is obviously good for the pigs as they're less likely to get sick. And it's good for the farmers because his livestock is less likely to get sick. And because fewer animals become sick or even die, there will be reduced waste and so reduced environmental impact relative to the feed inputs. And also, as I mentioned earlier, reduced use of antimicrobial products in the process. So the cost to the pigs and to the farmers and to environment and to society are all reduced if we can make healthier animals. I think that there are groups also looking at things like methane production in cows. But again, this is a a complicated issue. There is, I believe, a link between the genetics of the cow and how much methane it produces, but it's not a simple link because it's to do with the balance of bacteria that they host in their stomach and the, the environment that those um, bacteria inhabit. It's not work that I'm involved in, so I'm not really best qualified to talk about it any further at the moment. But yes, we, we can use these technologies to benefit the environment and to, to reduce impacts. Okay, thank you, Simon. One last question, and it's related to this uh, strange, also tragic situation we are living, the global epidemic uh, and COVID-19. And um, I would like to ask you, if the, the, the COVID-19 global epidemic has shown us how fragile the balance between human food needs and the ecosystem are. Uh, can genetic research help to make this balance less precarious? How? It's a difficult question to know, but I would like to, to close our interview with this. Okay, so I will try. Okay, so you're, you're talking about zoonotic disease yeah. here. So zoonoses are diseases that affect both animals and humans, where humans can contract a disease from an animal. Um, while there are some zoonotic diseases that can be acquired from our livestock, such as tuberculosis from cattle, in Western agriculture, we already have strict management systems that minimize these risks. Zoonoses are a risk factor whenever people coexist with animals, and it's widely believed that the current COVID pandemic arose because of close interaction between humans and wildlife in a market scenario that wouldn't be permissible in Europe. Coupled with dense human populations and easy international travel that have allowed this ready spread of the virus across the world. Now, it's probably just worth noting that most Europeans have a far closer interaction with their pets than with livestock, but we love our pets, so it's unlikely that we'll make significant changes to our lives in that regard, just in case there is a new zoonotic disease arises. Can genetic research help make this balance less precarious? In all honesty, I'm not sure. Um, 
if we can produce livestock that are generally healthier, I suspect the risk will be lower. And it's possible that genetic research will allow us to reduce or even eliminate some of the livestock zoonoses that we're already aware of. The real unknown is the unknown, of course, and the new diseases that we're yet to encounter. New viruses arise all the time, and some of these manage to cross species barriers, and then we have outbreaks. Some of these could turn into zoonoses, but it's really difficult to predict how these diseases will behave and how best to counter them until we first encounter them. At best, I think that advances in genetic research methodology will allow us to more readily adapt to the challenges ahead. You mentioned the COVID-19 question. Um, so this disease has caused widespread death and disruption to economies across the globe. And research methodologies that have been developed within my lifetime have allowed scientists to rapidly develop reliable tests for this virus which have aided in our ability to adapt control measures. I think without such testing, we'd likely be in a far worse situation than we're in currently. But everything that I can think of at the moment is adapting to things as we become aware of them, not really getting ahead of the situation. I don't at this moment see certainly how genetic improvement in agriculture can really make a big impact, other than, as I say, to have animals that are generally healthier. I don't think we can make them specifically healthier with respect to something that we know nothing about yet. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. It's uh, very, thank you for your contributions. It's really important. And, uh, uh, I hope to meet you in person, maybe next year in Mantua, I feel. That would be lovely. <laughs> yeah, we do. So thank you for your time and your contribution. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Have a good day. You too, bye. Bye.